Their manner of rambling through the woods to kill deer is a very laborious exercise, as they frequently walk 25 or 30 miles through rough and smooth grounds and fast before they return to camp loaded. Their method of fishing may be placed among their diversions, but this is of the profitable kind. When they see large fish near the surface of the water, they fire directly upon them, sometimes only with powder, which noise and surprise, however, so stupefies them that they instantly turn up their bellies and float atop when the fisherman secures them. If they shoot at fish not deep in the water, either with an arrow or bullet, they aim at the lower part of the belly, if they are near, and lower in like manner according to the distance, which seldom fails of killing. In a dry summer season, they gather horse chestnuts and different sorts of roots, which having pounded pretty fine and steeped a while in a trough, they scatter this mixture over the surface of a middle-sized pond and stir it about with poles till the water is sufficiently impregnated with the intoxicating bittern. The fish are soon inebriated and make it to the surface of the water with their bellies uppermost. The fishers gather them in baskets and barbecue the largest, covering them carefully over at night to preserve them from the supposed putrefying influence of the moon. It seems that fish caught in this manner are not poisoned, but only stupefied, for they prove very wholesome food to us who frequently use them. By experiments, when they are speedily moved into good water, they revive in a few minutes. The Indians have the art of catching fish in long trails, made with canes and hickory splinters, tapering to a point. They lay these at a fall of water, where stones are placed in two sloping lines from each bank, till they meet together in the middle of the rapid stream, where the entangled fish are soon drowned. Above such a place, I have known them to fasten a wreath of long grape vines together, to reach across the river, with stones fastened at proper distances to rake the bottom. They will swim a mile with it whooping and plunging all the way, driving the fish before them into their large cane pots. With this draft, which is a very heavy one, they make a town feast or feast of love, of which everyone partakes most socially, and afterward they dance together, singing hallelujah and the rest of their usual praises to the divine essence, for his bountiful gifts to the beloved people. Those Indians who are unacquainted with the use of barbed irons are very expert in striking large fish out of their canoes with long, sharp, pointed green canes which are well-bearded and hardened in the fire. In Savannah River, I have often accompanied them in killing sturgeons with those green swamp harpoons, which they did with much pleasure and ease. For when we discovered the fish, we soon thrust into their bodies one of the harpoons as the fish would immediately strike deep and rush away to the bottom very rapidly, their strength was soon expended by their violent struggles against the buoyant force of the green darts. As soon as the top end of them appeared again on the surface of the water, we made up to them, renewed the attack, and in like manner continued it till we secured our game. They have a surprising method of fishing under the edges of rocks that stand over deep places of a river. There, they pull off their red breeches or their long slip of stroud cloth and wrapping it around their arm to reach to the lower part of the palm of their right hand, they dive under the rock where the large catfish lie to shelter themselves from the scorching beams of the sun and to watch for prey. As soon as those fierce aquatic animals see that tempting bait, they immediately seize it with the greatest violence to swallow it. Then is the time for the diver to improve the favorable opportunity, he accordingly opens his hand, seizes the voracious fish by his tender parts, hath a sharp struggle with it against the crevices of the rock, and at last brings it safe ashore. Except the Chocta, all our Indians, both male and female, above the state of infancy, are in the watery element nearly equal to amphibious animals by practice, and from the experiments necessity has forced them to, it seems as if few were endued with such strong natural abilities, very few can equal them in their wild situation of life. There is a favorite method among them of fishing with hand nets. The nets are about three feet deep and of the same diameter at the opening made of hemp and knotted after the usual manner of our nets. On each side of the mouth, they tie very securely a strong elastic green cane to which the ends are fastened. Prepared with these, the warriors abreast, and jump in at the end of a long pond, swimming water, with their nets stretched open with both hands and the canes in a horizontal position. In this manner, they will continue, 
either till their breath is expended by the want of respiration, or till the net is so ponderous as to force them to exonerate it ashore, or in a basket, fixed in a proper place for that purpose. By removing one hand, the canes instantly spring together. I have been engaged half a day at a time, with the old friendly Chickasaw and half drowned in the diversion. When any of us was so unfortunate as to catch water snakes in our sweep and emptied them ashore, we had the ranting voice of our friendly posse comitatus whooping against us, till another party was so unlucky as to meet with the like misfortune. During this exercise, the women are fishing ashore with coarse baskets to catch the fish that escape our nets. At the end of our friendly diversion, we cheerfully return home, and in an innocent and friendly manner, eat together, studiously diverting each other on the incidents of the day, and make a cheerful night.